Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. okay. can you see it? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, all right, thank you. So I'll, I'll begin. So I'm going to talk about um, a different project, which is the very high energy electron proton collider, or as we uh, um, abbreviated it to VEEP. This was an idea uh, developed by Alan Caldwell and myself. And um, this is perhaps uh, slightly more speculative, um, but of course has the advantage of going to higher energies than um, uh, any other ideas around at the moment. So I will go through an introduction and motivation to this and then talk about the physics cases we've developed it so far. Initially, I'll talk about some challenges when we have very high energy electron uh, proton collisions. Um, then some of the uh, things that we've looked at are the total photon production, photon, proton uh, cross section, the vector meson cross sections, uh, the very low X physics, because we're at such high energy, we get to very low, low X physics and um, saturation. And then because we're also at high energy, we consider um, beyond the sun models, so it's high, high Q squared as well. So of course, a lot of these topics are similar to what was covered by Paul in his um, talk, and of course, uh, of interest for um, any kind of EP collider. Then I'll talk about the baseline parameters and also then compare the various um, options or colliders that that are around, and I'll just give a summary and outlook. So maybe just a few um, a few words which are relevant to what we heard before, and also the EIC in general, is that we've learned a lot, of course, from the IS experiments from the past, from the fixed target experiments in HERA, on all sorts of uh, physics that we're all familiar with, on proton structure, diffraction, jet physics, etc. And so I think um, a thrust of what we're talking about and also what was being spoken about by Paul is that a high-energy EP collider complements the PP program from the LHC and a potential E plus, E minus, e minus um, linear collider. So um, here is, as we know, is the only, so far, the world's only EP collider. And as we heard, the LHEC is a proposed EP collider with significantly higher energy and luminosity than HERA. And I think, um, as Paul pointed out, those two factors uh, are crucial to, to it because, of course, with the higher energy, energy new kinematic regime, and also with this higher luminosity, they have a program which maybe was unexpected at first in, in this area of Higgs physics, which we've just been discussing. Um, the EIC does not have such high energy, but I think it, its advantages are that it has intrinsic flexibility in its energy, um, its colliding particles, in that it has a multitude of um, ions that can be used, its polarization, of course, of both beams and uh, high luminosity. So then, what about uh, the very high energy collisions that we're talking about? So I think all the various possibilities that exist, um, also as Paul pointed out, are complementary machines, and have complementary physics programs, although there are similarities between them as well. So continuing on, um, maybe I have to introduce um, plasma weight for acceleration here, because in essence, this idea of having a very high energy electron proton collider is based on the fact that we have to have a new kind of acceleration technique to get electrons up to very high energy. Where of course, the problem is, is that accelerators using RF cavities are limited to something like 100 megavolts per meter, so if we want high energy, we need long accelerators. That limitation is probably actually, the real value is something like tens of megavolts per meter if you consider, say, the European XFL in Hamburg, or a future linear collider, or of course the LHCC race track that was just being discussed. So in plasma weight for acceleration, you can have much higher um, acceleration gradients of even up to 100 gigavolts per meter. Um, so this is done by uh, injecting a particle into injecting a bunch of particles into a plasma, and we want to try and do this with um, proton bunches from the high energy uh, machines at CERN. And by doing this, you create a disturbance in the plasma, which sets up a bubble-like structure and accelerating essentially accelerating cavities in which you have concentrations of positive and negative charge, and then you can inject an electron bunch into um, this essentially accelerating cavities and accelerate them up to very high energies over short distances. So we have an, exper- an experiment at CERN, which is an R&D experiment to demonstrate this effect. And so far we've just, we've been very successful in that we've accelerated electrons to 2 GeV in 10 meters of plasma. So although that's not huge, the huge values of 100 gigavolt per meter, it's still 
already significantly higher than can be achieved in RF acceleration, and we published it in the paper in Nature just a few weeks ago. So, of course, this means that this whole idea of using plasma wakeful acceleration is crucial to, to what we um, want to develop. And of course, we will do continuing R&D to understand this, but um, what we also want to do is think of what future possibilities there are based on this kind of um, scheme. Because although we have this huge energy gain, of course, there are some limitations in the electron bunches produced. Uh, as you'll see, the um, idea for the VEEP at the moment is uh, rather low luminosity. But so given a high energy electron beam, one could think of using a high energy electron beam for things like test beam infrastructure or uh, um, an acceleration, accelerator test facility. Um, perhaps then more interestingly in particle physics experiments, you could think about doing fixed target experiments like deep elastic scattering experiments um, that have been done before using a high energy, well, we're saying about 50, 100 or GV or above electron beams. There's also some, something that you could do, which is to, is to search for photons, dark photons, in which you have an electron hitting a target. And this leads to production of dark photons, which then decay uh, to um, electron positron pairs or other um, decay channels. And you can search for them uh, if you've got a, a high energy electron beam. And this has been done, for example, at CERN by the NA64 experiment, but they're limited by the fact that they use electron beams coming from the um, secondary um, SPS uh, beam where, in which the protons hit a target and you've got a very low rate of electrons. So actually you could get far more electrons on target using this, this scheme. But then what we're going to talk about for the rest of this, um, uh, this talk is the idea of then having a high energy electron proton collider. So we've had an idea that you could have something like a, a high energy electron pro proton collider in which you have the same sort of energy as LHEC, in which you use SPS proton bunches to drive electrons to 50 or 60 GV. Or um, perhaps more um, compellingly is that we have this very high energy electron proton collider in which we use, an LH use LHC bunches as the proton driver to accelerate electrons up to um, TV scale. So these are some of the ideas that we're thinking of as applications of this awake um, uh, plasma wakeful acceleration scheme, but of course there could be other um, experiments or applications that could be done. So maybe just briefly on this um, idea of the plasma electron proton ion collider. So this is something, if you like, which is, as I said, which is similar to the LHEC, um, but has, of course, uh, some notable differences as well. This is considering a high energy EP collider with an electron energy of about 50 GeV and colliding it with uh, proton, LHC protons of about 7 of of 7 TV. So as I say, this essentially is mimicking the um, energy reach of the LHEC. The difference being that you create this 50 GeV beam within 50 to 100 meters of plasma driven by um, the SPS proton bunch, and you have this LHEC type experiment uh, in the 50 to 100 meters of plasma rather than the um, kilometer or the kilometer longer LINAC that you need for the LHEC. However, the clear difference is, is that the luminosity is expected to, uh, is going to be lower uh, we, and um, certainly lower than about 10 to 30 per centimetre squared per second. So this means that um, this would clearly have a different focus to the LHEC in some ways is that a, is that a different machine. You, of course, there's no possibility of doing Higgs physics. Um, the high Q squared and um, some of the high precision physics that Paul was talking about would be impossible and so you'd really need to concentrate at physics at lower x such as separation and look at parton densities and QCD physics and looking at um, electron ion collisions as well as EP physics. So I think um, uh, it would clearly be a different machine. So, but I think it's an interesting question to ask as well whether a high energy EP collider can be cited at CERN with a minimal amount of new infrastructure, if you, if you actually need an accelerator that's 50 to 100 meters long, um, how can this be done? I think one thing to say is that we need to revisit the luminosity of this uh, and we keep having discussions with accelerator physicists um, at CERN and come up with trying to come up with ways of maybe increasing this. And I think this is something that we need to look at again. And also, of course, we need to work out the physics program because of course, as as, as we know, if you change the luminosity, if you have a different value, you can have a very different physics program. Um, but, if, but it's an opportunity maybe to uh, further studies, and we're continuing to do them in which you can design 
um, a collider using a new form of accelerating technology, plasma wave acceleration, leading to an experiment in a new kinematic regime, and we'll continue with those studies. Okay, but then, as I say, perhaps more interestingly um, for us is the uh, this uh, VEEP. This is a very high energy EP uh, collider. So I said that we would use uh, plasma wave for acceleration as the source of accelerating electrons because we want to have electrons at the TeV energy scale. So that's uh, pretty much unrealistic with any conventional RF accelerator to have TeV scale um, electrons. And of course, we have to ask a question about what, can, what physics can we do for such a collider? I mentioned them already on the outline um, page and I'll go through each of those. And this idea was published a couple of years ago by Alan and myself and the reference is given at the bottom of this page. Okay, so maybe just to uh, give you some ideas as to why um, the energy reach and uh, why we think we can do that. So this is um, making use of the current beams at CERN and um, applying it to this uh, awake scheme of having proton-driven plasma wave for acceleration. So we want to, <coughs> as I said, with this plasma wave for acceleration, you can either have shorter colliders for the same energy, which in a way was what I just spoke about, but now what we want to do is go to higher energy. If you take this plot on the right hand side, this shows you a simulation of proton driven plasma wake field acceleration using the LHC beams as the driver of the wake field. And this shows you that you can accelerate electrons up to energies given by this WE, up to energies even up to about 6 TeV in maybe what was it, 8 to 10 kilometers. So some, it's something like about, you, get, you gain about roughly a TeV per kilometer. So what we did was for our studies and as a sort of um, a starting point for, for this kind of new collider, we decided to choose an electron energy 3 TeV um, as a baseline. Um, and then if you collide electrons of 3 TeV with those from the proton, with those LHC protons at 7 TeV, this gives you a center of mass energy of 9 TeV. So this is by far the highest of the um, Central mass energy is all the proposed colliders as they exist. The reason, or some reasoning, or some um, other points to note here is that this acceleration of 3 TV is in under four kilometers, which means that as you'll see, we can have the long accelerating straight section in between within the LHC ring. Um, we can vary the electron energy, it should be reasonably. Um, it's straightforward, or at least part of the overall design, that if we can have it to have the electron beam at 3 TV, we should be able to lower it to 2 TV, 1 TV, etc., to do um, interesting studies which, which depend on that. And so this gives us a center of mass energy, which is a factor of 30 higher than HERA, and a kinematic, a kinematic reach to low, low X, which is a factor of a thousand compared to HERA. And, of, and going to high Q squared by a factor of 1,000, although, of course, that is um, more, more luminosity dependent. So on that um, fact, here was, is our uh, initial design. As I said, that we had the LHC ring, and within it, we can fit this four kilometer straight section in which we have uh, some of the LHC protons being, um, si those going in one direction, siphoned off, into this plasma accelerator in which they generate wake fields and accelerate electrons up to 3 TV. The other protons are also come off the um, LHC ring and they meet at some interaction points within, within uh, the LHC ring in the, in the um, straight section as shown in this, in this PowerPoint sketch on the left. <coughs> so our emphasis has been on using the current infrastructure. Um, as I say, the overall layout works in PowerPoint. Um, to, of course, to do the bending of the protons within the LHC ring will need, of course, higher magnetic fields and um, this high gradient magnet, magnet development going on at CERN, they would be um, utilized to do that. Um, I mentioned that the high energies, it looks like, um, at least uh, so far within the um, simulations of uh, weight field acceleration, you can get these high energies, but what about the luminosity? So we've made some assumptions about the luminosity. Uh, a feature of this is that at the moment, what we have to do is um, we have to um, use them in a single pass. That means we need to refill the uh, protons um, and use them and then refill them and then refill them again to have interactions. So we 
have something like 3,000 proton bunches every 30 minutes, and this gives us this frequency of two hertz. We have a certain uh, number of protons and electrons per bunch, and these are the numbers that we've, uh, uh, we've used. The value of four times 10 to 11 for the number of protons per bunch is, is more than is used in the LHC at the moment, and is more than that's, is actually planned for their LHC upgrade, but there are, uh, there are other um, schemes that, are, that use higher values. For example, within the AWAKE scheme, we um, use a value of three times 10 to 11, so it's, it could be possible to achieve four times 10 to 11 in the future. And then we have a, a cross section, which is again the, uh, the cross section of the beam, which is four microns, which, which is dictated by the expected values from the um, LHC upgrade. So you're putting these numbers into the luminosity, it gives you something like four times 10 to 28 per centimeter square per second. So that's clearly much lower than the numbers that we're talking about for LHEC or EIC. And um, you know, a year, a year of running is more like an inverse, an inverse picobar per year, um, rather than kind of inverse femtobars that have been um, talked about elsewhere. I will say, of course, that we are thinking of ways and schemes to increase this value and um, in discussion with um, accelerated physicists um, at CERN to, to do this. But given, so given the constraints, we then have tried to consider a physics case for a very high energy, so it's 9 TV, but moderate luminosity. So um, probably 10 is something where it actually fits into the calculation we had and 100 inverse peak is a slightly more optimistic value um, under the assumption that this can be improved by um, a, diff a slightly different scheme. So that's what we're going to consider now. So if we do that, then the first thing we did was to look at the kinematics of the um, final states. So here I show uh, the scattered electron energy and the um, scattered electron angle and the hadronic angle. So this was just a small sam test sample of Ariadne events run um, for these high energies. Um, it's just some small test sample, as they say, 0 0.01 inverse peak of one. So there's no real relevance to the number of events there, particularly except it is it corresponds to that luminosity value, but and that's not really represent, representative of the luminosity as I shared it says on the previous page. It was just to give to give some idea. So you can see that there's a kinematic peak at 3 TV with ele electrons sc scattered at very low angles. Um, the hadronic activity is in the center, is, it is in the central region, as you can see in the bottom right. It's also in the forward and in the backward region with um, the um, hadronic activity at low backward angles then for low x. You can see by this red line that for x of low, low, low values 10 to the minus 6, pretty much all of the hadronic um, energy goes down at very uh, low, angle, low angles. And of course, this has then clear implications for the kind of detector that's needed. And in our paper, we had a sketch which um, is shown here in which you uh, need some, some sort of conventional, if you like, central uh, detector, as you would in any sort of colliding beam detector um, in LHEC or wherever else. But you also need instrumentation at very low angles. And we just put in some hadron electron spectrometers here. And these will be uh, very important then for being able to measure at low X and also at high X. Uh, maybe looking at this in a bit more detail, a student of mine um, worked on making these plots of the kinematic plane, which maybe show more clearly the challenge. So you show here the electron kinematics, and you can see, of course, you can go down to these very low x values where um, you know, an x of down to 10 to the minus 8 corresponds to uh, around q, q squared of 1 gv squared. And you can see that uh, whereas Paul was saying you need angular coverage down to something like one degree, uh, angular coverage of one degree for us, as you can see, um, this theta is 179 corresponds to a Q squared of a thousand and relatively high X for, for this, um, for, for what we want to do. If we want to go down to very low X values that we're interested in down to say 10 to the minus eight, whatever, then you need coverage down to very, very low angles of a fraction of a degree. That's what I was saying before, the idea of having um, detectors, like some spectrometer type detectors um, at very low, um, at very low angles. And, uh, you can see that in this blow up here on the right where you've got these fractional um, angles of scatter. 
Okay, in the next page, um, we are showing here this effectively the same plots of Q squared and X, but now we're looking at the energy of the scattered electron. Again, you can see that uh, you have the roughly three TV electrons being scattered and then uh, decreasing um, values of energy. And again, if we focus in on this uh, point here around Q squared of one, X of 10 to the minus eight, then you can see that um, the scattered electrons can have very different energies, um, but uh, so it gives you some sort of chance of then distinguishing them. But of course, we will need very um, clever and good detectors to do that. Uh, on the hadronic final state, rather than just the electrons, here you see um, the similar plots showing now, rather than showing in terms of the angle of the electron, but now the angle of the hadronic system. And again, you can see that the region down, the region here of low X, low X physics, which I think is the most interesting physics to look at in this uh, kind of uh, collider and is anyway of uh, intrinsic interest, means that you've got a hadronic, a hadronic system going at very low angles of the order of uh, below a degree. And again, you've got um, on the right here, this is showing then the hadronic, um, hadronic energy and you have um, very high energy um, hadronic jets or hadronic system at these very low, uh, low X values. So you have very forward, very high energy jets, high energy jets to, um, to reconstruct at, if you want to investigate low X and Q squared. And so of course that will then reflect into the, uh, um, that reflects into then the detector you need. And certainly that PowerPoint sketch I showed a few uh, pages Okay, would need to be refined significantly. There'll be lots of interesting R and D to develop such a uh, detector. Okay, so then um, maybe the physics. Moving on to the physics at um, this very high energy electron proton collider. So what we're going to look at are cross sections of very low X, and of course, looking uh, by doing this, we want to look for observational evidence of saturation and you know maybe a completely different kind of proton structure. We want to measure the photon-proton cross-section at high energy um, and also at different energies and maybe see how that relates to cosmic ray physics. Um, looking at vector meson production and its relation to the, to the above, to the points I just mentioned. And then for the beyond, beyond the sun model physics, um, what we're going to consider are some contact interactions or looking at the um, radius of the quark. Or, Quark, and uh, of course you could maybe think of the radius of the electron as well, and the search for leptic quarks, which is probably the natural thing to look at in the high energy EP collision. Um, one could also consider photon, um, proton and photon structure, uh, in particular say looking at uh, the longitudinal structure function given that you can change the beam energy. Also you might want to think of um, electron ion scattering um, and how this is also relates to saturation OX. I'm not going to talk about those particularly in this talk, but there are certainly things that you'd want to investigate. Uh, and then again, something else which I'm not going to cover, but of course, um, conventional tests of QCD, looking at measurements of the strong coupling, all these kind of things. And, you know, the usual, if you like, QCD measurements um, would be done in a completely new pneumatic range. And so um, would be of interest at uh, this very high energy collider, but I'm not discussing those um, further. Okay, so here uh, just some graphs again for this very small sample of um, Ariadne events that I uh, generated just to show the x, q squared, y, and then the correlation of q squared and x. Um, uh, I said here, see Fergus people's talk, I mean Fergus's results, which I showed previously, which show the um, uh, correlation between the two more clearly. Um, but it shows that, you know, this is a very small sample of events and at low x and low q squared, we get a large number of events. And so I think this will be a powerful experiment for low x physics, where the fact that we have a relatively low luminosity um, is less crucial. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at um, is the total gamma p cross section. So um, as I said, the, uh, um, about the luminosity being less crucial, this is obviously a, um, a, a measurement where um, the luminosity won't be such an issue because you're counting um, essentially um, all events. It's a completely inclusive cross-section. So on, in this plot, I've shown uh, all of the um, measured data that's been done previously from all the various experiments um, before 
uh, going up to here around 20 GV in, in, in W, then a few more going up to the values from here, um, which are shown um, over here at the highest values of about 200 GV in W. So then what we did was we, as well as this showing these data, we then showed just um, a few uh, of the models, uh, the Donicky lanzoff um, predictions from 92 and from 2004, and also this log squared W squared um, uh, prediction uh, motivated by the um, Froissart bounds, um, which is shown here. And then we decided to um, put only one point on, although of course I did mention that we want to be able to vary um, this, this center of mass energy and actually probably we can add more points onto this. But this one point here is at a value which is um, corresponds to roughly the same um, fraction of the EP central mass energy as the HERA value. So this is at a value of about um, uh, 6 TV, uh, 6 to 7 TV in uh, W. We assumed the same uncertainties as, as, as the um, Zeus measurement down here, uh, and it's dominated by the systematic uncertainties and statistics are no issue. It only used, so the Zeus measurement used 49 inverse nanobarns of data. So we, as I say, I think we can measure at different energies with the same detector. Um, I think this will clearly provide cons strong constraints on the model and the physics. I think going up to this very high energy is really a good example of where you gain because um, certainly in this case, these models are starting to diverge and they start to, and they're diverging more as you go up in, in energy, um, so the Donicky lantoff models. Also, you can then try to relate try to relate this to cosmic ray interactions, just to say that this is equivalent to a 20 PV photon on a, on a fixed target at very, very high energies. Okay, so now I'm showing um, I'm showing a plot here of the vector meson cross sections. First, I should say that this top plot shown here, um, the top curve is actually the total photon proton cross section, which I showed on the previous page of all the data that exists. Um, so then the other vector mesons are, are being shown here as a function of the um, photon proton center of mass energy W again. So all of the all of the open points are existing data um, from a fixed target experiment shown as triangles, the H1 Zeus data shown as uh, circles, and um, the uh, ALICE and LHCB data from peripheral collisions that were mentioned also by Paul in his talk. So um, as was also mentioned in, Paul, in Paul's talk, of course the motiv motivation for this is that the strong rise is related to the gluon density at low x, and you get in the gluon squared into this rather than just, if you like, just the gluon to power of one. Uh, the nice thing about it is that you can measure all the particles in the same experiments. And here what we've done is then put on, if you like, some simulated data, simulated data of what, the, what VEEP could, could measure in the, as these black dots here up until some sort of limit of uh, kinematic limit. What's shown is the, we're not, we haven't compared to any particular saturation model here. All we've done is um, fitted, fitted the data that's been measured with just some polynomial, uh, some w to the power um, function. Uh, and this varies for, varies and increases to get a larger value of w as you go up in the mass of a particular particle. Um, so for the shape side, for example, we have this w to the power of 0.7. We extrapolated these up to the higher energies that we'll get at the deep. And of course, you, assuming uh, these um, extrapolations, you then get, to say, get um, of course, strange things like the shape side Cross section being essentially the same as a phi cross section, at some point crossing it and be higher, higher than it. So, of course, one would expect that um, this kind of uh, functional form would not continue and there had to, would have to be some sort of saturation or leveling off of the cross section. And that's exactly the kind of thing um, that we can measure at VEEP, and you know, that would then uh, presumably be um, strong um, in indications or see the onset of saturation. And this goes way beyond um, uh, here. Uh, what HERA could measure way beyond what, um, say, LHCC could measure, and also the LHC with their peripheral collisions. <coughs> okay, maybe, um, a similar kind of uh, investigation was done here by measuring the um, uh, DIS, DIS uh, cross section, sigma gamma p, so the virtual photon protein cross section, as a function of W. And here it's shown in bins of Q squared 
going from lowish Q-squared of 0.25 GeV squared to higher Q-squared of about 120 GeV squared. Again, the open, the open points here are sh shown are measurements from HERA or fixed target experiments. And then we've added on essentially what you could reach with, um, with VEEP at this high 9 TV central mass energy, which again corresponds to something like uh, a limit in W of around um, uh, 6, 6 TV. Shown on here again are two models which um, sort of fit the HERA and fixed target data at these low values of W. So a, full, a functional form, a very simple functional form of X to um, the power of minus lambda, um, or some form where you have E to the power um, of uh, um, B, some constant B, which depends on Q squared times the square root of log one over X. Which is, of, which is often used um, in, as a damping term in some PDF uh, descriptions. So you can see that these, uh, these differ strongly as you go to um, higher values of W, higher values of the focal point of central mass energy. We actually just put the simulated data points on the um, red curve on this, this uh, functional form here for no reason other than just that's what we chose to do. You can see that um, Depending on the form, you have, say, for this particular, this blue form, in which we, this x to the power of minus lambda, which gives a very good description of the HERA data. Again, if you extrapolate this to the very high ends we're talking about here, you start to see things, if you look down here, where the fits cross, and then the, effectively, the higher Q squared um, cross section is higher than the lower Q squared cross section, which doesn't um, make sense. As I said, the, the different forms differ significantly from each other. So I think that with this big kinematic reach that we have here, we'll be able to investigate this region and look at the different behavior of cross sections at very high energies, distinguish between the different types of models. Again, maybe also see onsets of um, saturation. And it gives us unique information on the form of the hadronic cross sections at very high energy. And, you know, just as, an, as I say at the bottom here, uh, and we don't really have any idea what's going on at the um, in this region, uh, climatic region, these very high energies, and we'll be interesting to explore QCD in this region. Okay, so moving on from uh, QCD to uh, the beyond the standard model type, type investigation. So an obvious thing to look at is the uh, looking at the radius of the quark, and this has been done, for example, on the right, in it's shown um, for the HERA experiments in which you take the inclusive neutral current cross-section you compare it to effectively the standard model prediction in which you have a certain PDF um, calculating the um, DIS cross section, you compare it with the data, and then you add in contact interaction terms to try and um, improve the description of the data to see if that then is an indication for a certain contact interaction, which in this case, uh, which is being uh, discussed here, is looking at the radius radius of the uh, quark, um, so the quark radius, and you get derived some limits, um, which is shown here. So uh, the limit um, um, is given uh, is given below, in which we use this functional form, assuming the electron is point-like, and you can extract some limits. With the higher energy from um, V, we'd then be able to extract more stringent limits, unless, of course, we see something um, I should say that fuller analysis is probably needed here. This is just a quick, uh, uh, a quick analysis to get a rough idea of um, what could be done. Perhaps more interestingly is, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the uh, uh, look search for leptoquarks because um, electron and proton colliders are the ideal machine to look for leptoquarks in which they fuse. Um, and of course, you have um, S channel production uh, on mass of the leptoquark which then subsequently decays. So again, on the right is shown a plot from HERA in which um, it shows you the limits on for a particular type of leptoquark. It also shows um, some limits from uh, ATLAS and L3, although the ATLAS ones, um, I guess, are now been updated. I'll show you some more updated results in the next slide. So I think the sensitivity depends mostly on the square root of S, mostly on the center of mass energy. And as we have in V, 30 times the central mass energy of HERA, this should give us extra sensitivity um, to, to this kind of search. So at the LHC, there, of course, they also look for leptic quarks um, in, uh, in a slightly different way. 
but maybe just the bottom line um, at the moment is that the reach of the LHC is currently something around the order of um, a TV and also and will increase um, in the future with the extra data that it'll take um, to um, the order of uh, two, three TV. Um, and the question then is, um, what can we do? And that is shown on the all right, so we did an analysis here. We assumed 100 in those picobarns, which is something we need to work on to be able to get those kind of luminosities. We looked at the high Q squared events above 10,000 GeV squared, and we generated data and a standard model prediction using um, just some Ariadne uh, Monte Carlo, in which we didn't have any leptoquarks produced. Uh, and then we could then um, set, uh, set a limit on the coupling which is um, shown on the bottom right, where we have the coupling. Yep, okay, that's the coupling lambda versus the massive electric quark. And you can see here you have limits which go up to uh, essentially the kinematic, um, kinematic limits of the central mass energy. And it goes significantly well beyond there and um, significantly beyond the LHC limits as well. Okay, so maybe just to mention, we also had a workshop um, last year in which we discussed other ideas for very high energy electron proton collisions. And here I just give a quick summary of what was talked about, which was, of course, observing saturation and theory of hadronic interactions and uh, some of the people who talked about it. But also um, of interest as well was the relation to low X physics, relation of low X physics to cosmic rays, as I've also mentioned, but also to black holes and gravity. And I think that was a, a very interesting relation between, between them, as well as new physics descriptions um, uh, such as classification by um, Dvali and others. There were some other talks on, of a more technical nature and they're just listed there. And just to give you a feel for what it was like sometimes was um, we had Al Muller and uh, Pierre Dvali talking about um, uh, saturation um, in Al's case and as I say this classification which is an alternative high energy theory and how um, the very high energies that we're looking at here could be uh, key to being able to um, investigate this kind of physics. Okay, so maybe just I'll mention the baseline parameters then I mentioned at the beginning, but these are maybe just to get, again give you a, a quick feel for it, that we're at a center of mass energy, a baseline of 9 TV, but we assume we can vary this electron beam so you could have a range of um, uh, the TV scale, maybe even up to 10 TV. Um, I think, so So far we've con considered electron beams, but maybe there is a possibility of positron beams, although that is um, a challenge, at least from an accelerator point of view. There's the possibility of polarization, at least as far as we can, as far as we know, if you accelerate, if you accelerate polarized electrons in a plasma weight field um, system, it maintains the polarization. Um, and of course, then um, the idea of having um, electron ion um, collisions, uh, so for example, electron lead or whatever ions are used within the LHC. So maybe I'll just compare here the various parameters of the possible options. We heard, you all know about, of course, the AIC. We've heard about the LHEC just in the previous talk and the FCC, in it, um, and here I've also included V in the table as well. So I think this is a useful table contrasting the advantages or the strengths and or at least the complementarity of each of the um, approaches. So clearly we have this with this feed project this as I mentioned several times, this, this uh, advantage having very high energies. We also think that you can have polarization, but clear, of course we have a clear disadvantage of a uh, lower luminosity at the moment, although we're trying to work on that. Okay, so if we compare that, this is that's kind of summarized in this um, uh, um, a few words here, what I was saying in the, in the table that I said earlier on. And so I'll, I'll skip over that as I'm coming towards the end that we've said most of it before. So just to summer, I've got one page on summary and one um, page on the outlook. So I think we've developed a physics case for a very high energy EP collider. It's uh, a center of mass energy of 9 TV, uh, but this is based on plasma wave wakeful acceleration, which is um, uh, technology that clearly needs uh, lots of work, but at least looks very promising so far. Um, we've got initial basic ideas of the accelerator parameters and text designs and kinematics. And this is a completely new kinematic region in EP collisions. I think um, that even though we've got these moderate luminosities, there is still a rich physics program because we have this very high um, central mass energy. I think often it's very, uh, we're taking this approach of, um, if you can't have the high luminosity, and clearly high luminosity is a good thing going to um, high energy. Um, okay. The, um, I've talked about the physics program, but there are also many other areas to be investigated and I haven't touched on. And I mentioned 
maybe here, so as an outlook. So I think there's lots to do to develop this further. I think for the acceleration scheme, there's clearly lots of issues that one could raise, and people could probably think of others as well. There's the separation of the drive protons and electrons. Uh, something I've mentioned a few times is can the luminosity be increased? Um, uh, what happens to the beams after the interaction in the beam dump? Because maybe you have something like an active beam dump in which you do something like search for dark photons or a hidden sector. The design of the interaction points clearly a, um, a crucial part and how, of course, the whole thing fits into uh, infrastructure. In terms of the physics case, I think there's still lots of things uh, that we could do. And so far, really, it's only Alan and myself who've done investigations, but we haven't touched on electron ion collisions at all. And um, uh, so the whole field of things to be thought of there at very high energies for electron ion collisions. Um, the low X physics, I think um, this is where there is really strong interest for this very high energy collisions and the search for saturation. I think at this very high energy, I think we must see something, must be able to say something uh, uh, definitive about saturation. And then of course, it would be interesting how this relates to um, things like confinement or maybe, um, as I say, these things like gravity, which were discussed by Julia Erdmenger at our workshop we had last year and how, how this relates to uh, um, theories of gravity. The high energy cross sections, just uh, looking at more, more of them, you know, we've looked at a few things, but clearly there's uh, a lot to be un understood from the very high energy cross sections and beyond the beyond sun model of physics. In terms of the detector, just to mention again, we've got, we would have to have the central detector um, but the forward detectors we would need in both directions and clearly this is a challenge and I think it would be an interesting um, challenge uh, to design a detector that can measure safe um, you know, hadronic final state going down the, the beam line along with a 3 TeV scattered electron. So I think that would be a very interesting detector challenge. So we welcome input, new ideas and studies and with that I will finish. Okay, thank you. Matthew. Hi, Rick. Um, so, so uh, from, first of all, congratulations on that uh, electron exploration. Uh, that was uh, that was very impressed, in fact. Um, but so, so the beam is going away at, at, at CERN for a while, a couple of years almost. Um, so, what is the plan for carrying on the R and D for awake, and and how does that time scale uh, jive with what you envision as a program of physics, uh, which has to take, obviously take into account the, the other physics programs at CERN? Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe I've got something here that I mean. So yes, yeah, so, I mean at the end, well, twelfth, the twelfth of November, essentially the awake program as we have it now finishes because that's when the proton running at CERN stops. There's some um, iron running which goes on. Um, for a few weeks after that, but the proton running at CERN stops, let's say, um, 12th of November. So that means that we no longer have um, protons which are delivered to awake as well as being delivered anywhere else for the whole of LA, the long shutdown too, which means that um, we essentially have a two and a half year break in data taking of proton-driven plasma wave acceleration. So of course, the two and a half year break means that Okay, we won't be having data, but it also allow, gives us the opportunity to try and think of an upgraded experiment and uh, a better experiment to um, uh, move on to the next stage. So we've, we're going through some stages now of planning what we, what we would do in um, a future awake run two, which would then have to start a course after LS, uh, long shutdown two in um, early 2021. Uh, we would probably be able to have something like four years of running because the um, long shutdown three is quite a long one during the mid 2020s, but it's long. It's longer for the LHC than it is for the SPS, which we use as our driver. So I think the year 2024 we could still use and still run with awake whilst the LHC isn't running, um, and so we'd have potentially four years of data taking. And during this time, what we want to do, and the program that we're developing at the moment is to demonstrate that we can accelerate bunches of electrons to higher energies, not just say the 2 GV, which is a great success that we've had so far, but go up to say something like 10, 10 GV and above. We want to demonstrate the beam quality and also demonstrate this is a scalable process. So, you know, if we can get from to 10 GV in 15 meters and 20 GV in 30 meters, et cetera. So we really want to demonstrate the scalability 
of that. And that's the that's the goals for um, this period of 2021 20, to 2024. At that point, one could one could think that you could have um, 50 GV beam, uh, or the weight scheme could generate a 50 GV beam, or that of that kind of order um, soon after soon after 2024. So potentially, one could think. If you could think of doing say like a fixed target, fixed target experiment or these dark photon searches towards the end of the, of the next decade, so from mid 2020s onwards. Um, but clearly, yeah, we're tied to the um, um, the CERN program. And I think this very high energy electron proton collider at the moment, you know, the scheme is, is that we have to, we can't just use the protons parasitically. So clearly, this would be something that has to come at the moment in its current scheme after the LHC. Questions or comments? Hi, uh, you were showing some of the uh, projections at very, very high W for the uh, for the JSR, and I was wondering whether some of them you could actually exclude or at least uh, put a constraint on given the uh, dispersion relations uh, that can be used because all that region is dominated by the imaginary part. And uh, you could maybe link it to the region at small w, which is the real part, at least from the point of view of just setting limits. So it, it would be important, of course, to measure all of this. Um, but at the same time, when you are showing different predictions, um, it would be interesting to know whether some of them are violating already uh, type of dispersion, knowing roughly the uh, amplitude that's close to threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, at the moment, as, as, as I said in this, this plot here, we just, it's a very simple fit of the data to W to some power. Um, and that's all, that's all we've done for now and just extrapolated them. Um, onwards, uh, without any other considering any other models. Um, uh, clearly, you, you you could do a more detailed analysis of that. That's that's, that's true. I don't see any other questions. So let's thank Matthew once again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hey, no problem.